thank you very much for, for the kind uh, invitation, because as I was telling just a short while ago, when we had a coffee, I always uh, like to come to Ireland, because it reminds me of the uh, very nice moment we uh, lived here when my country, Slovakia, was admitted into the European Union, and uh, the Ireland was at that time in the presidency, and they organized excellent welcome party for us in Cork, and then very nice rising ceremony in Dublin. So I realized that our two nations are very close because we like to have a cold beer, we like to have a good fun, and uh, we share, I, I would say, very much similar, similar uh, temperaments. Since that time, of course, I, I came uh, to Dublin and to other cities in uh, Ireland many times, and I saw the enormous rise, and I, now I see a uh, very uh, difficult uh, austerity time the island is uh, going through. And uh, therefore, I was very pleased that I could discuss also these issues yesterday in your uh, joint committee on European affairs, that I had a chance to raise some of these issues with your Minister for European Affairs, uh, Lucinda uh, Crichton, uh, but also Minister Howling, and I met also both uh, speakers uh, in your parliament. Kian Korla and Kahelok. This was my best Gaelic I can get, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I have to say that one thing I was repeating in all the mistakes that also we in the, the Commission are very much uh, impressed uh, with a very solid track record uh, the Ireland established in, in tackling the crisis in a close cooperation with Troika, with the, uh, with the Commission. And uh, even though I know that the times are, are tough, especially here in Ireland, but I think that there is also a lot of positive signs on the horizon. I think everybody was very much impressed by your exports, which have been also growing during this tough time, and I think that 6% is a very, very impressive result. Your high-tech industry is doing very well, your medical industry is doing perfectly, and also your agriculture, I think, is going through a very, very positive period as well. So I think that with the traditional uh, Irish resilience, hard work, and very solid track record, I believe that uh, Ireland will be very soon back on track and uh, very soon back in very, very solid uh, economic uh, performance. When I was uh, invited to speak to you about the community method, I very much welcomed the opportunity to do so because, uh, um, of course, this is the issue which is not discussed only in Ireland but uh, all, over, uh, all over the Europe. And uh, I think that, uh, especially with the Lisbon Treaty uh, entering into force, uh, we could see how the community method became something which is now called in Brussels jargon ordinary legislative method. So it means that uh, vast majority, well over 90% of the decisions are uh, adopted uh, through the community method, meaning legislative proposal from the commission and then qualified majority voting in the council and uh, the majority voting in the, uh, in, in the parliament. And I would say that uh, at that time, when the Lisbon Treaty was being uh, adopted, we've been all extremely pleased that uh, we are now concluding the 10 years of very difficult uh, institutional debate, that we are giving the European Union new tools which should be strong and good enough for managing the European Union in its enlarged form of 27, and that we are actually equipping ourselves with the tools which should help us to be more performant on the global stage. What we most probably didn't realize at that time was enormous economic interdependence, which uh, was developed over the years uh, since uh, we introduced Euro. And I think this was uh, one fundamental lesson of the crisis, that uh, independence now, more than ever, is requiring much stronger and much uh, deeper uh, integration. That we have to ensure that national economic and budgetary uh, policies uh, cannot have such a devastating effect on the uh, euro area as we have seen over the last years. We, I think, uh, realized the, the depth of this interdependence only when we saw that 2% economy can actually affect the situation in the whole eurozone and that actually we could create the global ripples uh, in the economic, economic uh, uh, development. If you look at the, at the causes or the roots of the crisis, I think we have to be very open and frank about it, that uh, the crisis was caused by irresponsible actions from the governments and the financial sector, which led to the massive debts and uh, to the uh, economic policies which were simply not unsustainable. We also have to admit that uh, globalization revealed 
the fact that we are lacking competitiveness, that we've been uh, living beyond our means and that we've been losing this competitive edge uh, which was so much plastically revealed when the globalization pressures uh, been so, uh, uh, so, uh, became so much present in, in uh, uh, the European, European Union. And uh, therefore, the, the fact that uh, we understood how the European economies are integrated whether they, whether they are or they are not part of the Eurozone, means that simply in the future we cannot support uh, loose canons of irresponsible uh, uh, economies and policies of this nature in, in the future. So for us in the Commission, I think it's, it's quite clear that the Europe's response to the, to the crisis uh, caused uh, uh, very clear or led to very clear con uh, conclusions that we need to uh, cooperate much more efficiently, and we need uh, to look for more rather, uh, rather than uh, less Europe. And I think that one lesson was also quite clear, that the framework which the Lisbon Treaty uh, brought to us simply was not enough from the point of view of economic governance, from the point of view of uh, uh, political and financial instruments we had at that time at our disposal, and we had to do everything on time. We had to fight the immediate crisis, and at the same time, we had to lay down the infrastructure for the future, uh, for, for the future cooperation, for the deeper integration, and build in the preventive mechanisms which would not allow us to have the same crisis situation, uh, crisis situation uh, again. The Lisbon Treaty was very much the treaty which I believe uh, strongly strengthened the parliamentary dimension of, of the European Union, be it uh, in the European legislative uh, process by the strengthening of the position of the European Parliament, by putting it on the equal budgetary and legislative footing with the Council, but also by involving more and more the national parliaments, be it through subsidiarity check mechanism or be it uh, uh, also through the political dialogue which we introduced from the Commission because we just simply realized that uh, um, especially in the fields like economic uh, governance, like uh, uh, the debates on uh, the sustainability of our budgetary policies, we would need more and more of an interaction between the Commission and the national parliaments as well. Very often I heard, especially uh, the last year, um, after the stormy first months when the Lisbon uh, Treaty uh, entered into force, the discussion who was the winner and who was, uh, who was uh, uh, the loser. And uh, of course, uh, the Commission was very often described uh, that is in the uh, position where its uh, influence is being, uh, is being uh, weakened uh, and where we are like losing some of the power to other uh, uh, European institutions, particularly the European Parliament at that stage. But I cannot agree with the assessment because I serve something like the uh, interinstitutional interface. I'm commissioner, but I represent also the commission in the General Affairs Council, in the council which prepares all, all summits which is the last one before the leaders uh, sit together, where we exchange a view with Herman van Rompuy, where he is uh, uh, presenting his views and uh, uh, listening to the response from the, from, from the ministers so he could be better prepared for the meeting and the prime ministers or the presidents could be better uh, informed what they might expect once they, once they come uh, to, to Brussels. I also serve as a commissioner responsible for the relations uh, with the European Parliament I, and I went through all the difficult negotiations uh, on the framework uh, agreement so I can I can really see the situation from the uh, from the uh, three perspectives and if I can make one conclusion it's quite clear that the Lisbon Treaty actually strengthened all three institutions it strengthened the union and it strengthened the cooperation and it forces us to do uh, more uh, than uh, we did before. It forces us to cooperate uh, much more closely than before and it's put uh, the Commission very often in very demanding position of the honest broker when we come to the conclusion of the legislative process and we are looking at the solution which is acceptable for all three institutions. If you look about some, I would say, most uh, 
evident uh, and positive uh, changes brought by the Lisbon Treaty. I also have to, of course, uh, uh, mention except uh, the increased transparency of the process, increased democratic legitimacy of the EU decision-making uh, process, also the, 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 the most visible changes which have been brought uh, by, the, uh, by uh, the Lisbon Treaty. The first one, of course, was the creation and uh, the election of the first uh, president uh, of the European Council. Also at that time there was a discussion, is it a good thing how it would uh, fit into the overall uh, construction of uh, the European cooperation, but I think that after um, two years of the crisis, when we have uh, uh, several absolutely crucial summits, it's quite obvious that we've been actually lucky that the Lisbon Treaty entered into power before the crisis uh, went to this very severe uh, uh, period, because I cannot imagine how one would be able to be president or prime minister of his or her country, and at the same time would be able to run the, the European Council with all the responsibilities that the European Council got over the recent year, especially in tackling the crisis. I think that both uh, the thanks to the, to the personal qualities and, and, and personal features of both presidents uh, Barroso and Van Rompuy, the cooperation is excellent, actually mutually reinforces uh, both the uh, institutions. They have regular meetings on Monday mor morning when they are discussing uh, agenda, when they are, I would say, dividing uh, their they roles uh, and, and tasks, and of course they very much respect the treaty. So if it comes to uh, appearances at such a levels like G20, G8, uh, President Barroso speaks on what are the Commission competencies, and you know them very well, from, from agriculture to, to transport. Uh, and uh, the President Van Rompuy speaks about uh, what uh, are his responsibility, like CFSP, CSDP, and uh, the cooperation is uh, working, I think, very, very smoothly. New element which was also brought to the forefront was the creation of the External Action Service, and we discussed it uh, yesterday at uh, several meetings because uh, I participated in so-called quadrilogue where the Commission, Presidency, uh, Cathy Ashton uh, for her new service and the European Parliament when we've been actually working on getting it done, agreeing all the changes and building up the, the European External Action Service. And of course, uh, 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 I'm sure that uh, you would understand that it was not an easy exercise to get uh, all these institutions working together to create new European diplomatic or to merge the, the cultures of the Commission officials, uh, Council officials, and of course national diplomats. Now uh, the European External Action Service is there. The Cassie Eshton is, is performing her duties. She doesn't have the, the easy task uh, because also the global situation is not easy. But I think that uh, she would need also in the, in the, in the future uh, more, uh, more support uh, from the foreign minister so we can really use also this uh, new tool uh, to, the, uh, to the fullest. Speaking about other institutions, I should come, I should come back to the, to the competencies of the, of the Commission. Because if you look at them um, from, from purely analytical point of view, I think we also would agree that the Lisbon Treaty actually reinforces the, the competencies of the Commission. Uh, Lisbon Treaty preserved a near monopoly on the legislative initiatives, its executive functions, and the power to adapt non-essential parts uh, of uh, the legislations to the changing circumstances. These are the famous delegated and implementing acts or the former uh, comitology we some, sometimes so much uh, discussed uh, and uh, uh, sometimes uh, creates a lot of preoccupations by the, by the national parliaments. I think that uh, I can tell you with a, with a practical experience that the Lisbon Treaty uh, reinforced the, the community method and actually um, clearly, uh, clearly underlined uh, the vital role of the, the Commission in, in, uh, in the uh, whole uh, process. Uh, our chair was speaking about uh, the uh, directorium, about uh, the meetings between uh, Chancellor Merkel and uh, 
uh, and uh, President uh, Sarkozy, and it's true that newspaper headlines give the impression that uh, Chancellor and uh, the President, who are leading us uh, uh, out of this uh, crisis, uh, uh, are really in the in a front, uh, forefront of uh, these discussions. And I think it's uh, also very natural that the two major uh, and biggest uh, economies of the European Union work towards the solution to the current crisis. But I have to underline that this is only part of the process. Because if you look uh, uh, how this crisis has been tackled, from what aspects uh, we had to uh, address uh, these challenges the crisis brought to the European Union, you would see that uh, the actual recipes and uh, the actual measures which been adopted been adopted through the community method. Because what is our major tool, how to prevent the crisis uh, from taking place? This is uh, the legislative package um, six-pack, which was really worked through on uh, um, the communitarian basis, based upon the legislative proposals coming from the uh, from the Commission and after very close uh, cooperation with the task force which was also formed by the uh, Hermann van Rompuy. So we've been working on the two parallel tracks, but in the end, the result was the legislative proposal which came from the Commission and which was then swiftly approved uh, by the Member States and uh, by the uh, European Parliament. So we can say that uh, in these very difficult times, also this uh, parallel approach has actually helped us to build consensus much faster and um, help us to agree to the level of the coordination, to the level of communitarian cooperation, which is unprecedented. And uh, when I uh, remember the spirit uh, of the discussions when we've been discussing the uh, Lisbon Treaty, or before that, uh, the, uh, the Constitutional Treaty, I think that if somebody would, at that time, would propose something similar to the six-pack, simply he would be laughed at. Because at that time, it was unthinkable that we would be able to, to make such a leap forward into the integration and in such a sensitive areas like we are now covering in the six-pack. So I would say the lesson learned from the crisis, then uh, the uh, very good uh, understanding of the problem, cooperation uh, between both presidents and very important uh, role the Commission play in the formulating the, the needs uh, for the better economic governance and making concrete proposals which were then approved by the Parliament and uh, uh, by, the, uh, by the Council. If you look at another measures which have been adopted to tackle the crisis, it was quite clear that we need to address the problems of the financial sectors. And we went uh, through uh, different measures how to improve the governance of the financial sector, how to actually complement what was very much missing and was one of the reasons we end up in this very, uh, difficult, uh, in this very difficult crisis, which was lack of uh, uh, solid regulation of the financial sector. Therefore, we, uh, we proposed, and now it's already in place, the new supervisory structure, new three European uh, authorities which are forming together European Systemic Risk Board, which is uh, now very strong, solid regulatory uh, body, which we believe will, uh, will bring uh, new ways how to supervise and regulate uh, uh, economic and financial uh, industry. Another example which I would like to describe to you is how we are using the communitarian methods to actually manage better our economic future. We realized uh, that also national policies have such an influence on each other on, and on the overall uh, European situation, that we must proceed with much better uh, coordination in that area as well. Therefore, we came up with the concepts of annual growth sur uh, survey, with the concept of European semester and national semester. What I'm talking about. Commission now, now before the end of every year, brings and presents uh, the annual growth survey. 
This is our analysis uh, in which we highlight what we believe is the crucial for the European economic development uh, in the next year. What are the major problems we should tackle and on which we believe uh, the national economies should focus their attention. Then we start with the European semester when uh, the Commission's uh, analysis uh, is discussed on the level of uh, economic uh, finance ministers on the level heads of states and government. And once we agree on this analysis, then of course uh, we are pushing the national member states to adopt their national reform programs with the specific uh, responses to these European problems. And also these national, uh, it's, it's called uh, uh, country-specific recommendations are discussed on the European level and these recommendations are adopted as a collective commitment uh, uh, coming from the European side and coming from the, from the national side. Uh, and then the European semester is becoming the national semester and we see that through this way we'll be able also to, uh, to coordinate uh, our uh, policies better and to be in more coherent approach uh, to our uh, economic development. One issue which was very problematic also here in Ireland, but in Spain and in other countries, was uh, uh, the presence or uh, recurrence of uh, economic uh, or macroeconomic imbalances. I call them for better understanding bubbles. We had internet bubble, we had real estate bubble, uh, we had construction bubbles in the European Union and uh, of course uh, these are the phenomena which are very difficult to tackle uh, to be tackled from the government point of view because governments are happy when the economy is growing and uh, sometimes uh, it's very difficult to, to accept the fact that maybe this, uh, this growth is not healthy and I remember how many debates we had on uh, these imbalances on these bubbles and uh, uh, how difficult it was to adopt uh, any measures against these developments. Therefore, we decided to tackle this issue as well from the European level. The last week we adopted uh, the first uh, assessment uh, report where we highlighted the 12 member states because of the potential problems with macroeconomic imbalances uh, should be uh, deeply analyzed, should be evaluated, and if the conclusions would be that there are clear risks uh, of the imbalances, also new measures should be taken to, to prevent these imbalances into becoming bubbles. And uh, of course, this is another tool which we will use uh, to prevent uh, these negative economic uh, developments from, from happening. One thing I, I would like to uh, underline, and by this I would like to underline also very important role the Commission plays in all this exercise, is the fact that we intend to use the, the new powers the Commission got under the new economic uh, governance uh, to the fullest. Because we cannot risk that we would end up with another broken stability and the growth pact, which was so eloquently described by Mario Monti just two days in the European Parliament, because he said in the European Union we do not have good guys and the bad guys. We been in this negative development, all of us together. The stability and the growth pact was for the first time broken by Germany, France, and it was during the Italian presidency. <laughs> so all three big economies been somehow complicit in that, uh, in that development. And therefore, it's quite clear that uh, once we put the, the six pack into the operation, we want to use it from the day one uh, with all necessary uh, authority and using all the powers. And you could have seen the consequences of this approach already in January of this year, because in December the Commission sent out the warnings, as somebody called it, love letters from Oli <laughs> to, to, five, uh, to five member states. And uh, three of the member states uh, uh, clarified their positions and corrected uh, their budget deficit immediately. For Belgium it was particularly difficult because you know that they've been forming the government uh, for some time. They've been discussing the budget for some time as well. But then there was a stark choice to be made. Or one billion uh, euro cut 
or quite, quite hefty fine. And in the end, we've been very pleased that we found the solution with the Belgian government. The budget deficit correction was, was corrected and uh, the Belgian is on, 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 the, on, on the right track. The one country where we didn't succeed uh, yet uh, was the Hungary. Uh, but there, a lot of discussion also on other item is taking place right now. And uh, uh, there, because it's not uh, a member of the Eurozone, the mechanism doesn't imply the financial, uh, financial fines. So there is look for another uh, possible sanctions. And when we discussed it in the college, the conclusion was quite clear. The more uh, we will be looking for uh, the proportional way how to sanction this negative budget, <coughs> budget development in the Hungary uh, in the form of freezing part of the part of the euro funds. But this would be the measure which would come in place as of 1st of January of the next year, and we hope that with the close cooperation with the Hungarian authority, we will be also able to uh, solve uh, uh, this uh, issue. If you allow me now a couple of uh, words on uh, the subject, which is also quite hotly debated in Ireland, and this is inter, uh, intergovernmental treaty. I think it was quite obvious uh, over the last two years that uh, the treaty, the structure, we have the monetary uh, union, which was uh, uh, built by using the common currency among the uh, EU 17 member states, would need to be complemented by the economic union. And this was the primary cause and primary reason why we started uh, the, uh, the discussion on how to do it. Of course, the preference of the uh, commission was to proceed in 27, to proceed through the regular amending procedure of the Lisbon Treaty, but as you know very well, this was not possible because two member states uh, um, were not uh, able to support uh, such an approach, and therefore we had to go for the intergovernmental uh, intergovernmental treaty. I have to say that uh, the commission didn't ask uh, for this treaty because it sits outside of the uh, EU treaty uh, framework. As I said, we believe that uh, most of the changes we can achieve uh, through the secondary legislation. Some of the things which we couldn't, we believe that uh, uh, we could propose through the regular amending uh, procedure uh, to the treaty. But as I said, because we lack the consensus, it was uh, not possible. So then we in the commission focused very much uh, on, uh, on uh, the content and, uh, and uh, uh, the spirit uh, uh, of the treaty. And uh, I have to say that in the end, we've been uh, very pleased uh, that the outcome and, uh, and the spirit of the treaty went into the direction which was very important, very much welcomed by uh, the Commission and by uh, the European Parliament in the end. So what was achieved? At first, no new institutions have been created. Secondly, it's quite clear that the primacy of the EU law is clearly acknowledged. Then it was underlined several times uh, in the text of the treaty that Commission has a central role in delivery of the treaty objectives. Then it was clearly highlighted that the treaty uh, uh, and uh, the performance based upon the treaty must be always in conformity with the Lisbon Treaty and the community method. And uh, on top of it, we've been very pleased that uh, we managed to convince the, our, our partners uh, in the negotiation that uh, this international treaty should become the part of the legal framework of the EU within five years, which we see as a very important uh, safeguard for the, uh, for the compatibility, not only on the text of the treaty, but also on all the actions which will be stemming from the treaty uh, in the future. And I know that uh, um, uh, there is the concern in Ireland uh, as to whether the implementation of a treaty would uh, necessitate a new referendum. And our understanding is that the Attorney uh, General is looking at the issue now, and of course the Commission fully respects the internal procedures uh, 
for the ratification of international treaties in each member state, including Ireland, of course. So what would be, what would be, the, what would be uh, the future as I see it? I believe that now we are in the situation when we are slowly, slowly putting the, 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 the last pieces of the, of, the, of the puzzle into this very complex uh, mosaic of the new quality of economic governance into the, uh, into the new quality of the, of the future uh, economic union. And that uh, we are building the system which I believe will help us to uh, proceed to the exit of the current crisis. And therefore there is time not to focus our attention only on immediate emergencies, but we have to look at what is so important and so much felt across the whole Europe, and this is how to restart the growth and how to restart the jobs, the jobs creation. Therefore, we've been very pleased that uh, the last informal European Council was already not in emergency mood. It was the normal informal European Council after several months when the leaders have been discussing the prospect for the job creation, how to restart, uh, how to restart uh, uh, the growth, and how to tackle unemployment, which is a particular problem in, in your country, and which is a particular problem in, uh, in uh, my country as well. Therefore, we came up with the idea, which I, which I was also presenting yesterday uh, uh, to the members of the European Committee of uh, your Parliament, where the uh, Commission will do its utmost to start uh, the close cooperation with the eight member states on tackling the youth uh, unemployment. We uh, suggested creation of so-called uh, action teams where we would like to get together government representatives, social partners and Commission experts and we would look how we can use uh, uh, the, the European Social Fund or what still has not been uh, allocated from, from other funds to the better use of the creation of the jobs for the young people. How we can amend uh, the legislation or proceed with the active uh, labour policies in a way that we would uh, be able to offer young people something which is called job guarantee. In Austria it, it works in a way we, which we would like to see replicate uh, in all the countries where there is such a big problem with the youth unemployment, meaning that within four months after the uh, end of your schooling, you should uh, have a guarantee that you will be or uh, working, employed. If this is not possible, that the requali requalification courses uh, would be offered to you or you will get the possibility to continue your studies. Because the, the prospect of having uh, almost 30% uh, young people unemployed in Ireland or more than 35% of young people uh, not working, not uh, uh, in school, not in training like uh, we have now in Slovakia is simply enormous waste of time and we are wasting the potential of what is probably the best educated young generation we ever had uh, in the European Union. This kind of cooperation is already taking place also in, uh, in uh, Ireland. Uh, there will be the uh, team of experts coming from uh, the Commission to, uh, to Ireland already next Tuesday, and I believe that we will have uh, all the uh, necessary expertise and uh, all necessary insight on in how we can use uh, the uh, European funds uh, in Ireland to the better use uh, for the young unemployed people. Coming back to your country, I was uh, starting about uh, what could be the sources of growth. In your case, you, I already named the sectors which are doing so well. But I also have to pay tribute to your compatriot, to my colleague uh, Moira Gegan-Quinn, because she's uh, uh, doing an excellent job in simplifying all the procedures uh, for the researcher, scientists and SMEs to use the EU funds for research and innovation. And um, I have a good news for you. You became the scientific superpower of the European Union because uh, you are the, uh, uh, the medium-sized or small member states. This is how I describe my country as well. But you already uh, manage to achieve excellent results because uh, you are getting 20.7% of the overall EU 
uh, contribution going to the research and innovations programs for the SMEs. And this is enormous achievement because these are, these are not pre-allocated pre many. This is fierce competition based on the high quality research and the high quality, high quality uh, project. And uh, um, therefore, what would be very important for Ireland would be our efforts to get rid of as many barriers in the European Union as, uh, as uh, we can, because uh, we do not have money for fiscal stimulus in the European Union. There is no such a member state which has money for fiscal stimulus. What we have to use is we have to use to uh, much better use our single market. We need to use uh, better the potential of 500 p uh, million of potential customers and clients. And therefore we came with the Single Market Act where we see that there will be 12 uh, legislative proposals coming on through the fast track procedure, which would be aimed exactly at that, removing the barriers and creating the possibilities for the small, medium enterprise and for businessmen to use the market better. So if you allow me to conclude by saying that uh, I clearly believe that the Lisbon Treaty strengthened the community method, that the Commission got absolute uh, new powers, uh, uh, especially in the field of economic governance, which been unthinkable just a couple of uh, years ago, and uh, that uh, the success and uh, the power of the Commission would, of course, uh, very much depend on how we would perform the duties but also on how much we would be supported by the member states. Because we are um, there for cooperation, we are there for working together, coordinate our actions, but the political support uh, for the Commission is always uh, necessary, and in some difficult times, I can tell you, very much welcomed. Thank you very much. Thank you.